I'm Dennis Anderson along with Maria Hewitt and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Essentia Health announced its new hospital building is substantially complete and gave a tour to media today. We will talk with leaders from UMD's College of Pharmacy and Medical School about plans to co-locate in Duluth's downtown medical district. And we'll take you to Iron River, Wisconsin for the Northern Pine Sled Dog Race. Those stories and voices of the region coming up next on Almanac North. Hello once again everyone and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Maria Hewitt is here filling in for Julie this week. Maria, welcome. Thank you. It is great to be here and it's an absolute privilege to sit next to you. <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> great to have you with us. So let's begin with the headlines. All right. Thanks, Daddy. Thank you. Hibbing Taconite was granted new mineral leases by the Minnesota Executive Council this week, extending the life of the mining operation. HibTac has nearly exhausted its reserves of mineable ore and was expected to run out of taconite by 2025. The additional 120 acres granted this week should extend mining to 2026, while Cleveland Cliffs seeks mineral rights to land near Nashwalk that could extend mining for decades. Explore Minnesota Tourism released its 2022 Travel Indicators report showing the state had more than 77 million visitors last year. The agency estimates those visitors had a $13 billion direct impact on Minnesota's economy. The Minnesota Department of Revenue says leisure and hospitality sales contributed nearly a billion dollars in state sales tax in 2022. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers released his proposed capital investment budget this week with a $3.8 billion plan to improve the state's infrastructure. $1.8 billion would go to the UW system campuses. Republicans control the Wisconsin House and Senate and will have the final say on the governor's proposal. The Duluth Seaway Port Authority and Visit Duluth kicked off a rite of spring this week with the 40th annual First Ship Contest. Entrants try to guess when the first saltwater ship of the season will arrive here in the Twin Ports to win a nice prize package. The Sioux Locks opened on March the 25th, kicking off the Great Lakes shipping season in full. Now last year, the first salty arrived just after 6.30 p.m. on April the 13th. Essentia Health announced today that its new hospital building is substantially complete, marking a major milestone for the project. Contractor Makeup Construction will transfer control of the building to Essentia as it waits for a certificate of occupation from the city. Local media were given a tour of the building this morning. We're really excited to have this project reach substantial completion. You know, really proud of all the teams working on the project, um, our trade partners, our internal staff, um, the community. Um, to bring this project in on time and on budget is a great feat, especially through a pandemic. Um, so we've we've reached substantial completion on the project, which means you know doesn't mean the contractors are 100% done yet, but we're very close. We're we're getting everything wrapped up, our punch list items and a few minor other um, parts and pieces put together until we get our certificate of occupancy. We are reusing a lot of things from the legacy St. Mary's. Um, however, those will come over closer to first patient day or during the move. Um, so all the things that are coming in today are new items. Hospitals are amongst the hardest types of buildings to build. You look around these spaces and, and what you're seeing is, is the finishes on the walls. Most of the complexity you never see is public. Most of that's happening in mechanical rooms and all the systems that go in, hundreds of systems that go in to these buildings to make them safe. So as of this week, we are no more hard hats in the building. And uh, at the end of March, we're gonna be pulling some of the barriers in around the perimeter of the building. So, uh, you know, 4th Avenue will reopen, um, some of the lanes up on, down on uh, Superior Street and 2nd will open as well. But right now, we still have a lot of truck traffic, even with the loading of the building. If you happen to drive by 1st, you'll actually see there's a temporary loading dock uh, that's built on 1st Street right now. 1st Street will remain closed um, until June? End of June. End of June. Um, and that's because that's where trucks are coming through and truck traffic. So we still need to keep people safe in those zones. There will still be a lot of vehicle traffic and unloading um, of everything that has to come into the building. 
We've been in operational readiness. We've been thinking about these, these workflows. Now we're in the activation phase. So the building gets loaded with uh, furniture and equipment. And as Dan can speak to it more than I can, but a lot of that equipment needs to be calibrated um, so that it's ready on, on day one. And then the staff will come in and get not only tours, but be able to work on the floor and say, you know, how do I enter the room? Where do I foam my hands? How do I care for the patient in the room? How do I leave the room? Uh, clean my hands. Uh, so it's it's a really new, exciting way of, 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 of working. Uh, the move sequence, it, we're working with a, a company called Healthcare Relocations, and they've moved over 500 hospitals, and they've been consulting with us in all this transition period. And the move process is a two-week process, and our consultant likes to say that the patient has uh, breakfast in the legacy hospital and lunch in the new hospital. So it's well orchestrated, safe, uh, healthcare providers with the patients when they're transferred over. Uh, so it's, it's, it's well thought out before we go in into the new building. There's a lot of work left to do. It's not over yet, but now it's the exciting time. Quite the building. Meanwhile, the College of Pharmacy and the Medical School at the University of Minnesota Duluth could soon be part of Duluth's growing medical district. The university has proposed co-locating the programs downtown and is hoping for approval from the state legislature. Here with more on that proposal is Dr. Kevin Diebel, the Interim Regional Campus Dean at the University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth campus, and Dr. Grant Anderson is Associate Professor and Department Head with the Pharmacy Program. Thanks, gentlemen, both of you have been here tonight. Uh, Dr. Diebel, what's the vision for this facility now that you're going to go into? Yeah, so the vision for this facility for the medical district uh, in Duluth is to have a shared space for the College of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine to share programming as far as high fidelity simulation. So teaching for our pharmacy students and our medical students in a simulated environment. It's also a space for us to have clinical research taking place right in proximate location of the hospital systems. And it's also a place uh, for us to uh, expand our vision and our footprint of what medical training would be here in Duluth, where we can continue to occupy our space in the UMD campus, but extend into the medical district for a training that could include the years three, four, which has been historically been part of our program. So here in Duluth. years three and four will be downtown then? That is a possibility with uh -huh. this new space. Mm -hmm. Because currently, uh, three and four usually move down to the Twin Cities campus? That's correct. So the Duluth campus was always established as a year one, two basic science right. campus with partnership for training in other locations. And right now that's in the Twin Cities. Sure. Uh, Dr. Anderson, maybe you could speak a little bit more about because prior to this expansion of the medical district downtown, you know, we've always had a thriving medical community. What has the relationship currently been um, for the pharmacy school and the medical school with St. Luke's and Essentia? Oh, that, we've had a, just an absolutely great partnership with St. Luke's, Essentia, other critical access hospitals in the area as well. Um, if it wasn't for St. Luke's and Essentia wanting pharmacy to be here in the first place, back in the early 2000s, we wouldn't have been here. And this is really in response to their uh, workforce needs that were articulated back in the early 2000s and are still there. So our, our, our job is to provide uh, well-trained pharmacists to, to go out throughout the state of Minnesota into rural communities um, and also really locally here in our, in our own home in Duluth. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Diebel, healthcare locally is responsible for about 30% of total local employment according to the city of Duluth. Even so, there seems to be a shortage of nurses here. Is, is that true across the entire state or the, the larger spectrum? That is true. The shortage of nurses can be felt as an impact throughout the state of Minnesota, both locally in Duluth and also in our rural communities as well. Why do you think that is? Uh, the shortage of nurses could be uh, due to a lot of different uh, types of demands in where nurses do their practice, where they do their training, how many individuals want to go into that particular profession, mm -hmm. plus the burnout associated with the pandemic that was uh, just recently upon us. Sure, understandable. Where are we in this proposal to co-locate? Do you have an idea of where it would be, what it would look like, or what, what's the progress report? Yeah, so we, we have done a space needs assessment back in 2018, and that the university does this to determine if there's a need for new infrastructure. And, and it was determined for pharmacy and medicine uh, on this campus, we need new infrastructure. Uh, and so we have a bill that's been put forward, uh, Representative Koslowski and Senator McEwen from, uh, from here in Duluth have, have put these bills forward into the Capital Investment Committee. Um, so they've been entered into the process. 
Now we'll see where it goes from there. The legislature has a lot of things that they're trying to consider funding and the university has a lot of projects that they've put forward. But really we have great support from, uh, from as I said earlier, the, the local health systems, mm -hmm. from the city of Duluth, the mayor. Um, uh, this is a, a really a strong project. It's important for people here in the Northland to know that the university has five campuses. They have lots of asks and right now this year there's only five asks for infrastructure for the entire university system for the legislature to try to fund. And what we're looking for is planning money and we're one of the five. That really shows I think the university has uh, is really really behind this uh -huh. project and hopefully we can get the funding so, to do Dr. this. So Dr. Anderson, what kind of impact then will this have statewide for example? Yeah, a large impact. I mean, we we are in the College of Pharmacy. We're the only college or school of pharmacy in the entire state of Minnesota. So we're responsible for training pharmacists throughout our entire state, and we have a track record for ha having pharmacists that are from UMD that are practicing in all communities throughout the state, including our rural communities. Mm -hmm. The same is true for for medicine. That's why we're here because medicine has been uh, was here before us and really has had the same uh, impact over over the many years. Mm -hmm. So having this new this new building will allow us to have more education together. We call this interprofessional education. This is how healthcare works now. It's in, it's in teams. It's just so complicated that uh, you know a pharmacist or a physician or a nurse working in isolation is not nearly as effective as working as a team, and that's what we're trying to achieve here. When do you ha hope to have this up and running? How long will it take from now? Well, right now we're in the process of getting the money for the pre-planning and pre-construction phase. You think phase. the legislature will go ahead and fund what you need? Uh, we're Partially. very hopeful yeah. that the funding will come through and this will take about a year to do that project and then we'll come back with a second ask for the actual money for the building itself and then construction there could take a couple years. Mm -hmm. How would this impact the current buildings on the campus or the current programming on the campus? Uh, we plan at the School of Medicine to retain the place that we have in the University of Minnesota Duluth campus to continue to do the basic science research that we have associated with our campus and to probably continue the basic science uh, training as well. So we look to retain that footprint at the Duluth campus and then expand into the medical district. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Anderson? Yeah, I think it's important to note that the planning money is really helpful for us to plan. What are we going to do? Where are we going to be downtown? That's probably a question you have as well. Uh, what are we going to do here at, on the UMD, at the UMD campus where we currently reside? And we'll, we'll figure that out when we get this money. But our, our UMD partnership is, is critical. It's been two-way. Uh, we really benefit by being here on the UMD campus, and the UMD campus really benefits by having the School of Medicine and the College of Pharmacy here, and we certainly are not going to be leaving entirely this campus when we, when we have this new Are you seeing downtown. a growing uh, response from uh, students who want to go into pharmacy? For pharmacy, it's actually the opposite, and this is, an, this is uh, something that is a concern across the entire country. We have 13,000 seats for pharmacy students across the entire country. 142 uh, schools, and we only have about 11,000 applicants. And we're right. starting to feel that in Minnesota. We're the number three ranked school of pharmacy in the entire country. Really? And we are starting to struggle recruiting pharmacists. And we're, we're really concerned that if we don't train enough, we'll, we'll see in the future, down the road in yeah. a few years, maybe a dearth. And we need to address that yeah. now. Well, I wish we had more time to talk. We, we simply don't. Uh, Dr. Kevin Diebel from the Duluth Medical School and Dr. Grant Anderson from the Duluth Pharmacy Program. Thank you both very much for being with us tonight. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thanks for having us. It's time now for Voices of the Region, when we hear from an area journalist about stories they are covering. This week, our guest is Marshall Helmberger, publisher of the Timber Jay News in Tower. We've been reporting for the past several weeks on a shocking case of abuse of official authority in Voyagers National Park and the Park Service's absolute refusal to address concerns raised by local residents, as well as by the Timber Jay. The concerns stem from an incident last June in which two park rangers tased a local business owner twice on his own boat while he was assisting an elderly couple who had run their houseboat up on rocks on Lake Cabotogama. The houseboat was a rental from Ebel's Voyager's houseboats 
And it's a locally owned business that served uh, visitors in the park for decades. And when the houseboat ran aground, they called the company owner, Justin Ebel, for assistance. Now, he arrived sometime later and managed to free the houseboat from the rocks. And then he directed the couple to pilot the houseboat into a nearby narrows that leads into a protected bay so he could inspect for any damage to the boat before letting them resume their excursion. It was a very windy day at the time, and it made it difficult to control the houseboat, which is why Ebel wanted to get the boat moved to a more protected location. Two park rangers had been hanging around for some time watching it all. At one point before Ebel arrived, they had pulled up and asked the couple on the houseboat if they were okay and needed any assistance. The couple said they were fine and that help was on the way. So the park rangers pulled away but remained in the general vicinity. Everything seemed to be going as planned until the park ranger suddenly roared up to the houseboat as the couple was maneuvering into the narrows and demanded that they pull back and head into the main part of the lake so they could speak to them. Now, we interviewed the elderly couple who were from South Dakota, and they said the ranger's order was inexplicable and they felt to put them in danger given the high winds and their proximity to the shore at the time. They radioed Mr. Ebel and told him what was happening. And Ebel told them to continue with the plan and that he would speak to the rangers. But the rangers weren't interested in talking. Instead, when Mr. Ebel resisted their demands and suggested that they talk to his clients once they were in a more protected location, the two rangers boarded his boat and tased him twice, rendering him temporarily paralyzed. Now, since we learned of this incident last summer, uh, the Timber Jay has, has repeatedly requested information about the incident from the National Park Service. We have forwarded numerous questions about the basis for the Rangers' actions. And last August, we filed a FOIA, or a Freedom of Information Act, request seeking the criminal complaint that the Park Service filed against Mr. Ebel, along with other records, including body cam footage. To date, the Park Service has provided exactly nothing. No relevant response to our FOIA, no answers to any questions that we forwarded to Park Superintendent Bob DeGrosse. I have to say in my 35 years as a reporter, I have never seen a public entity that has been so resistant to basic compliance with the law and their own media guidelines. We don't know the status of the park rangers who assaulted Mr. Ebel or whether their actions are under any kind of investigation. The only way we've been able to gather information is through interviews with Mr. Ebel and the couple who had rented the houseboat. That couple, by the way, say they love America's national parks, but say they'll never visit voyagers after their experience. And that's a concern that many residents and business owners around the park have expressed in recent months. And finally, we're reporting on plans for a so-called Second Amendment Town Hall set to be held Saturday in Ely. It's sponsored by the state uh, GOP and features local representative Roger Scraba and Senator Nathan Wessenberg, a locally or a newly elected conservative firebrand from Little Falls, who at a rally in January suggested his support for the arrest of Governor Tim Walls for his emergency orders during the COVID pandemic. He's also referred to COVID vaccines as death shots. Now, Representative Scraba said he hopes to hear from constituents on a wide range of issues, but it's likely that gun safety legislation currently making its way through the legislature is sparking some of the concerns from gun advocates. The timing of the event has raised concerns among supporters of gun safety regulations that it's part of an effort to get Minnesota counties to refuse to enforce any state or federal law that some view as restricting Second Amendment rights. Neighboring Alaska County passed such a resolution just last month, and that decision came under withering criticism at the county board meeting in Grand Rapids this week on Tuesday not only for the wisdom of the resolution, but also for the way it was handled. It was a last minute addition to the county board agenda. So there was no public notice that the board would even take up the resolution. And supporters of the resolution appeared to have had advanced knowledge that the item would be uh, added to the agenda. And they showed up in force to speak in favor of the idea. Many of those who appeared at this week's meeting urged the board to repeal the resolution or at least bring it up for reconsideration. Now, Representative Scraba said there's no connection between his town hall and any effort to pass a similar resolution in St. Louis County, but not everyone is convinced.
As the sled dog racing season begins to wrap up in our region, the Northern Pines Sled Dog Race has widened its parameters to include a diverse field of racers. Producer Megan McGarvey traveled to Iron River, Wisconsin to bring us back this report. So we're in Iron River, Wisconsin, and this is the annual running of the Northern Pine Sled Dog Race, um, which is a, just a one-day race. This is the fifth year. We started with 20 race, racers the first year, and this year we have 100 teams here. We have a 32-mile mid-distance race, a 16-mile sprint race, our first time in Wisconsin, a worldwide weight pull. We have a four-dog, 4.4-mile race and a six-dog, eight-mile race. Races go through the Chewamigan Forest and the county forest around here, and they're shrouded by beautiful white pines. It's a wonderful trail. On this beautiful course, one of the unusual courses where you can see so much of the race, the dogs go out and you watch them, at least at the start. A lot of races, they just go out into the woods and they're gone. But, you know, that's one of the real nice things about this race. Started with the mid-distance race. We sent all those mushers out and there's about 20 of those. Then there's the sprint race and I believe there's 11 teams in the sprint race. They go about 16 to 20 miles an hour for 16 miles. And those are more like hound dogs as, a, as opposed to the husky dogs, like Alaskan Huskies and Siberians that are in the mid-distance. We've tried really hard to include different mushing disciplines so that we bring together the different groups of dog people. And uh, we like to do public education on mushing. We like to support the sport this way so that we bring in all these unique people and their dogs. Historically, um, weight pull dogs were used to deliver groceries. Before cars, like horses, they were work animals. And so people would go to the store and pick up their gear, their food, and the dogs would pull the, the sled back home. So they would, were cargo animals. So this is to sort of reenact that time where people train their dogs for strength and endurance to pull heavy items. And people can train their own house pet to do this if they want. So they don't have to be professional to compete in this race. This is a pretty impressive type of race we have here, being that it's the first in Wisconsin. We have about 70 or 80 volunteers that help put this race on. It's, people are more and more interested in coming every year to help us out. I know I talked to some, one person last night who uh, uh, was, felt very fortunate that they could find a place to stay. I think, it, I think it fills up the area motels and there's just a lot of business for, or, you know, the local businesses get a lot of revenue and it, it's, it's just a, it adds some enthusiasm into the, into the, you know, into the local culture. It's great to have a, a race in a community like this that involves so many businesses and encourages people of all ages to get involved. You know, a lot of the other races are very narrow in their perspective, but we've broadened our perspective to include all ends of the rainbow and hope that it continues to grow. It's Mario Hewitt. I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.